Pues tu cerebro es para pensar en muchas cosas divertidas y hacerlas. Está aquí. Eres tú. En la gaveta. Brain is for creativity. Helps you remember things. To listen. Not fool around. Para escuchar. The brain is for intelligence. Está conectada a nuestro cuerpo. Y así es como podemos hacer todo. Store a lot of information from different parts of my life. Para compartir a los zombies. What is it that will make some of these babies thrive while others won't? Why would some of these children grow to become healthy, happy adults with loving relationships while others will not? What will make some of these toddlers go on to college and pursue rewarding careers or fulfill their professional aspirations, while others might have to settle for a lot less? Why would a number of these children make their dreams come true, while others might not be as fortunate? Is it a matter of fate, money, intelligence? Is it luck, hard work, genetics? Is it a question of education? In our ongoing quest for understanding who we are and what determines our future, science has revealed a remarkable finding. What happens in the first few years of life before formal schooling begins helps to lay the foundation for future success. What children experience, even before they learn how to talk, increases their chances of reaching their full potential and might be the key to creating better societies for everyone. And the secret lies in the most unsuspected place, our young brain. It is only now, after decades of scientific advancement and technology, that we have begun to understand how the baby brain develops and how this early period lays the foundation for who we will become in the future. In fact, our capacity to learn, absorb information, and shape our behavior and understanding of the world around us will almost never be as powerful as it is during our first few years of life. I sometimes have to remind people that we are our brains. <laughs> so um, if, you're, if you're seeing, if you're hearing, if you're feeling, um, and if you're deciding, if you're thinking, if you're reading, etc., this is your brain in action. During our early years, the brain is optimized for learning and is capable of extraordinary change. No wonder a baby brain can create more than a million new neural connections every single second. They say practice makes perfect, and that is exactly what the brain does. Every time we learn or experience something new, it detects a change, and that change forms connections, which help build the foundation of a powerful brain. The connections that are not used repeatedly are lost. During the early years, when the brain is at its most active, is when the roadmap of our lives is first designed. Although change is possible as children grow, science is proving that getting it right from the beginning is the best opportunity we have to increase our chances of happiness and success. Children are natural learning machines. They are born ready to learn. They already have learned some things, even in utero. The brain scientists like to say it's experience expectant, meaning the brain is sitting there 
with all of its neural machinery ready to be programmed for whatever, you know, for a language, for a culture, for a set of values. The reason that early experience is so important to the baby brain is it sets up routines to predict the future. The frequency with which events happen in the world make a big difference to the brain. And the brain tends to settle on things that happen most frequently. And in a sense, it's a genius solution because if you want to come into the world flexible to learn any culture's values, then you should come ready to learn, as I said, experience expectant. The first three years of life, I think, are the magical years for intervention because the changes that we facilitate then can last for the rest of the child's life and of the parent's life and create a new way of relating. What a child experiences directly affects the way the brain gets built. For better or for worse, what they're exposed to and how they're treated is going to have a major influence on their chances to thrive now and in the future. And if we thought that socioeconomic status determines our potential outcomes, the results from a five-decade-long experiment with low-income children in the U.S. might actually prove us wrong. Children who get a really good, solid early childhood education foundation are more likely to continue their education when they leave high school. They're more likely to go to college. They are four times more likely to graduate from college. They are more likely to get highly skilled jobs that pay more. Uh, they are actually healthier as adults. It all started in the 1970s, when income and social inequalities increased in the United States. Researchers Craig and Sharon Ramey Joseph Sparling and Francis Campbell began one of the first experiments of its kind. Their mission was to study whether the course of a baby's life could be altered when the foundations of the brain are first built. The program is called the Abyssidarian Project, and their experiment consisted in randomly assigning 111 babies born into poverty to one of two groups. Both received basic support and nutrition, but only one got the added bonus. Specially designed, high quality, educational childcare. When we began the Abyssinian Project, now 45 years ago, we knew that the developing brain was really the focal point of what we wanted to have a positive influence on, because the brain is connected to everything that, that we do. I think it's fair to say that the Abyssidarian children, now adults, are probably the most carefully studied group of children ever oh. in the, the history of science. It can be so big when you get older. Yeah. You are, uh-huh. Still today, five decades later, researchers at the Virginia Tech Carilion Research Institute in Roanoke, Virginia, continue to track the brains and lives of all Abyssidarian children. All right, this one's a quick 10 second picture. You're just gonna hear some uh, beeping and buzzing noises. Just need you to relax and hold as still as you can. I'll check in with you once it's done. The wealth of information it has collected over the years is proving that a quality early child care model influenced by brain science can change the lives of children and their families forever. Kendra Alston is the living proof of the benefits of having been enrolled in the Abyssidarian project with the added bonus since birth, but the program had unanticipated results in these babies' mothers. Judy Alston, Kendra's mum, enjoys a meaningful career and has put an end to the cycle of poverty that loomed over her family for generations. My mother, she works with the GED program at Durham Tech. 
And so she sees girls who are pregnant. Well, my mother asked them, so why didn't you get your high school diploma? And they'll tell her, because I got pregnant. So she shares the, her story about me. And so she'll probably talk more about this later, but um, she's that inspiration for them. I'm probably a little bit more proud of Kendra only because I was a single mother. I, I was, you know, I was a teenage mother and we were destined to fail. One of my friends had a daughter that was five months younger than Kendra. So they were pretty, pretty much, you know, right there together. And so when the four of us would get, get together, there was just so much difference and Kendra seemed to be more advanced all the time. They just enhanced my maternal skills and just teaching my baby, because I was a young mother. Go ahead and laugh. No, I'm done. It's not funny anymore. I didn't know that they were challenges. I didn't know that um, growing up that I was living in public housing. I didn't know that Growing up, we were receiving public assistance. I didn't know growing up that my mother's age mattered, you know, to society. And it was a indicator oftentimes to my success. I didn't know that at the time. The Abbasidarian children's remarkable outcomes even surpassed the team's initial expectations. Not only did they score an average of 15 IQ points higher, but compared to the control group, they reported a higher earned income, a higher job prestige, and higher age at birth of first child. Kendra is a fine example. A mother herself, she was the first in her family to earn a master's degree, and she now owns a successful teacher training program, works as a teacher, and also mentors young girls. If you're wondering what exactly did the Abbasidarian offer in order to achieve such results and long-term success, it all comes down to high-quality interactions between adult and child that are frequent, intentional, and individualized. Interactions of this kind continue to transform the lives of kids and parents all over the world, from Denmark to China. The results from successful experiments around the world are changing the way we think. Together with the latest scientific studies, they're not only helping us to get rid of the myth that a child's opportunity to thrive is determined exclusively by genes, IQ, class or status. They're also helping us understand that all babies, no matter where they're born, come ready to learn. Because none of us can remember our lives before we were two or three or four, depending on when your first memory is, um, it's easy to think that there's nothing happening in there. The idea that we would um, think about learning as something that doesn't happen until you're five or six just doesn't make sense scientifically. And so kindergarten prep begins in the crib begins at birth, begins with the parents' knowledge of how, what their contribution is going to be to the baby's brain development. Because a brain has to be built. It comes ready to learn, but it's not built yet. Researchers, scientists, and educators have defined a set of four brain-boosting experiences which will strengthen those pathways and help children, including those with special needs, to be better prepared for school and for life. A nurturing, responsive parent or caregiver, rich language, play that promotes learning, and good nutrition. 
And while our brains continue to evolve and have an incredible capacity to recover, it's easier and better to start early. That's why introducing a healthy dose of these experiences just after birth is at the core of a global movement known as ECD. ECD stands for Early Childhood Development. And one of the things I'm noticing is that people all over the world, uh, governments, but, but individuals in those countries, are focused on this early period in a way they've never been before. People are realizing that if you really care about education, you have to care about what happens before the children get to school. Responsive nurturing parenting is the first of the experiences babies need to boost their brain power. But parenting, often called the most difficult job in the world, is largely based on instinct and the experience of others. The good news is that scientific insights can help strengthen parenting skills for all, including extended family and neighbor caregivers, as well as teachers and early learning providers. One of the things that science shows us is so critically important for brain development is what we call serve and return interaction. It's this responsiveness, this responsive two-way interaction between even infants before they can talk and adult caregivers. They don't differentiate between a blood relative, an adoptive parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a neighbor. They just need that kind, that interaction and they need to, to be able to expect a response when they put up a serve or a request for interaction. And so where that response comes from uh, depends on who's available. Children are going to learn from whatever they're exposed to. And if we want children who are uh, helpful and uh, risk-taking and uh, engaging, then we have to be those things with them to allow them to get there. We have more influence than most people realize. Oh, God, son, I love you. You, and then what's the other one? You remember the other one? Sing the bed night-night song. And I say, Cars There are a number of tools at our disposal that allow us to study different types or different aspects of brain development, depending if we're talking about babies or young children or older children. For babies, the, the two tools that are used most often tend to be recording the brain's electrical activity or the EEG, and there we can place these sensors on top of the head and basically listen in to the neurons communicating with one another. Until babies develop language, all communication is nonverbal. So they depend heavily on looking at a face and sort of trying to derive meaning from that face. Is this person happy with me? Are they upset with me? Things like that. Both of those tools can be used in newborns and then continue for many years after that. Observing how this baby reacts to different expressions accomplishes two goals. It tells us what is going on in babies' brains when they see faces and facial emotion. And most importantly, it helps to distinguish between babies who are developing normally versus those who are not. The baby is engaged, responsive, clearly emotionally content. Then, Dr. Tronic instructs the mother to disengage by making a still face. She stays there, but doesn't respond to her baby. Mackenzie is confused at first. She's not used to mom acting like this. 
Mom turns back, but keeps the still face. Mackenzie expects her to re-engage, but when she doesn't, look how the baby reacts. Even at this young age, she tries to entice Mom to interact with her. She reaches out. She smiles. She flails her hands. All strategies for getting Mom's attention. When that doesn't work, she becomes fussy, emotionally agitated. And finally, she just gives up. Dr. Tronic then asks Mom to re-engage. It takes a moment, but soon the world goes back to normal for Mackenzie. Children are resilient, and breaks in close connection happen all the time in everyday life. What usually then takes place in good relationships is this reconnection that we've seen. I'm convinced that if people knew what to do, they would do it. If they knew that television was a lousy babysitter because human beings need interactivity, they need relationships, they need to sit on people's laps, they need to be sung with. If they knew how to go into the grocery store and the year-old child, or year and a half, two-year-old child is sitting in a shopping cart and I'm mom or I'm dad, let's get one, two, three, four of these. This is a square, this is a circle. Oh, I see a bird on the box. It has wings, here's what wing. Real conversations with real people is education. parenting and caregiving helps build babies' brains with the nurturing they require, but it also helps set the stage for language, the second key experience that increases their chance to be happy and thrive. Language is important not just because it's a medium of exchange, but because it's our first symbol system typically, and we build all of our other symbol systems on that. So whether it's musical notation, or formal logic, or mathematics. Measurements show that while at three months of age and at six months of age, they could discriminate all the sounds used in all the languages of the entire world. They're still not talking themselves, but their perception narrows and specializes on the sounds that they're hearing from their parents. this in some of our projects around the world where parents don't talk to their kids and when you ask them why they'll say well they don't talk to me so they just therefore don't think there's anything to say because it's a one-way street and as a result these kids are not being linguistically stimulated they also may not be cognitively stimulated intellectually challenged Our studies show that the higher the prevalence of motheries or parentees, because both parents do it, that you know, high-pitched, very pleasant to listen to, very slow and deliberate and clear speech, the prevalence of that in the home at 11 months or at 14 months uh, face -to -face, in face-to-face -face conversation predicts the number of words a child will produce at the age of two. And regardless of socioeconomic status. It isn't about money. It's about the parents and the time and engagement of the children. Bye-bye. Adios. I see. Adios. Bye-bye.
Bye bye. Yeah, I see you. Hola. Yeah, a bear. What color is that bear? If we used to think about play as just having fun, science and the ECD community now urges us to think again. Play in all its forms, from free self-directed play to role-playing assisted by caring adults, prepares a young brain for life, love, and even schoolwork. Making play the third key experience all children need during their early years. We look at how they first play with little blocks and turn them around in their little teeny hands to being able to build structures that show us what they can do with words like in, around, through, under, and on, which will build the foundation for later mathematical knowledge. Um, we look at how they play and how in those moments, what seems like just play, they're actually learning social skills of how to get along with people. They're even picking up some of the content that's gonna be important to later communication like language and reading and literacy. We're looking at how they learn to learn. In those moments of play, our kids are getting pretty smart. What we've seen in the research that we've done with a preschool program and kindergarten program called Tools of the Mind, is that what really is needed is um, a lot of time for children to be self-directed. So a lot of time for children to play, to learn about getting along with others, to cooperate with others, and for teachers to take a little bit of a step back from that. But when kids are, when kids are engaging in these kinds of activities, these sort of play-based activities, self-directed activities, they're doing well in terms of their math and in terms of their reading. I think really acquiring the kinds of skills that, that many families, that many parents would like to see for their children. The secret sauce is not fancy toys and computers and electronics and, and that. Things that allow their imagination to run wild, like play and relaxation, that's what builds a really good brain. It may seem obvious to many, but music has a special, almost magical effect on us. Whether it's singing, dancing, humming, or playing an instrument, science has proven that music is like a shortcut to happiness. What is interesting now, however, is discovering that children who learn to play an instrument or sing create more connections in their brain. And this contributes to their ability to learn math, read, and even boosts their physical development. The neuroscientists are telling us that when they image the brain, they see fundamental changes which are sustained across the lifespan, particularly if you've been learning an instrument or singing in a sustained way for two years. Music plays a role very early in development at predicting patterns. And at four to five, just the act of synchronously moving extends to uh, personality traits like being helpful and being cooperative. It's very easy, I think, for schools to feel they need to be focusing on literacy and numeracy, and those are the things that they're judged by. But actually, music can be the thing that unlocks that child's path to learning in a way that nothing else might. And so we see impacts in terms of, so literacy in particular, um, numeracy uh, to some extent, um, physical development.
Together with proper sleep and physical activity, we know that babies' brains need the right food in order to recharge. In fact, even before they are born, good food helps boost their brain power, making nutrition the last of the four experiences all children need during their early years. Breastfeeding is important as a first food. We know that there are many be benefits of breastfeeding. There's benefits to the immune system. There's be benefits to cognition. There's benefits for the mother, um, to her health in terms of breastfeeding. There's benefits for growth and development for children. The other thing that happens with breastfeeding is it's a way of attaching and bonding. Adequate nutrition with the proper minerals, vitamins, the, the, these nutrients, um, they are the fuel and the accelerant for, for all this growth. And it's in that period and this growth and then fueled by the nutrition is then the child's ability in the future to learn, to be productive, work, earn, uh, and then to ward off uh, chronic diseases. If we put that in the pot with the neurodevelopmental stuff, you know, it's important part of the perspective that we realize we have got to start now to make that difference over the next 20, 30, 40 years uh, with, the, with the babies that will be being born in the middle of this century. Quality parenting and caregiving, enriched language, play, and good nutrition are the four core experiences we can provide to improve and influence babies' brains and their environment. But what do babies really need to learn that will help them thrive when they get to school and later on in life? Since the baby brain is sculpting the brain of an adult, the ECD community has discovered something that helps children cope with what we generally think of as innate social and behavioral issues, and it goes by the name of self-regulation. Self-regulation in kids would be, uh, a good example would be being able to regulate an impulsive response for children. Every, every parent's seen that, everyone's had to deal with it, the extent to which children may want to do something, they want a, immediate gratification, and they have to delay that gratification to use their sort of emotion regulation skills. And parents need to support kids in being able to do this beginning in infancy. And up through the toddler period and into the preschool period, the best ways to, to help children uh, acquire these skills. She makes me mad. She makes you mad? Why did she make you mad? Because she won't make me mad all night. She's making you mad all night. What did she do that made you mad? Um, she's not sharing with me. Yeah, she's not sharing with you. You hear that? She's, yeah. she's upset because you're not sharing with her. Do you want to share? Something you want to share with Sissy? When children have difficulty controlling their impulses, uh, they get in trouble. They get in trouble with their uh, peers. They get in trouble with their parents. Our concern, particularly for kids who are having difficulty regulating their emotion and regulating their attention, that they will begin to develop sort of self-perceptions, perceptions of themselves as, as not being good at that, not being good at school, not being good at getting along with other kids. And the idea that that will sort of lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you had to choose, would you like to have one marshmallow? Yes. Or would you like to have two marshmallows? The whole point of the experiment is to set up an intense conflict between the two. Now here's how we play this game. I'm gonna leave the room while I'm gone. If you can stay here and wait for me to come back without eating the marshmallows, then you get two marshmallows. Okay. But if you don't want to wait, you can make me come back right away the bell. by pressing the bell. But then you get one marshmallow, not two marshmallows. I won't ring the bell. You won't ring the bell? Okay. What we found is a very simple and direct way 
of measuring a competence that seems to make an important life difference. The longer they were able to wait at age four, the better the ratings of their ability to control themselves and to pursue their academic and other goals. Kids were able to delay gratification are increasingly learning ways of managing frustration, ways of managing distress. In middle life, there's less drug use, higher educational level attainment, much less likely to have lowered self-esteem, uh, to engage in bullying behavior with other people. The correlations are clearly statistically significant. But that in no way means that a youngster who at age four didn't wait a long time is in any way doomed. While self-regulation is about controlling impulsive responses, learning executive function skills is what will help children avoid distractions and focus on achieving their goals. Important skills they need now and in the future. These basic brain processes are um, the ability to um, hold information in your mind so that you can use it. In other words, responding in appropriate ways to different circumstances. And that means you don't go on autopilot. Executive functions bring together our social, emotional, and cognitive capacities so that we can achieve goals. So no wonder the kids who set goals and follow through on them are the ones who are most likely to um, succeed. ECD practitioners all over the world are raising awareness on how a lack of these early childhood experiences and skill sets may deprive hundreds of millions of children the chance to fulfill their potential. Because much like architecture, brains are built from the bottom up. And if the foundation is weak, it can compromise its strength and quality. Investments in education are increasing but not paying off as much as people had hoped. And one of the reasons they're not paying off as well is because young children are underprepared for the learning environment that they encounter. They've already experienced deficits in learning, in inquisitiveness, in confidence, in what we call these um, metacognitive skills. That is why translating the science and getting it out of the labs and transforming it into high-quality models and intervention programs is part of the mission of the ECD Global Movement. These programs focus on helping children learn what they need in terms of enrichment. But enrichment is practically useless if overloaded by the serious, real-life stressors which affect almost half of the children in the world today. The part of the brain that's really reactive to stress is sort of overactivated in these children, and everything is perceived as a threat, whether it's a threat or not. If you perceive a threat in front of you, you're going to go into survival mode. So they're survival mode. They can't, they can't use the cognitive capacity of their brain to help them problem solve and think things through. They become very reactive. It's helpful to understand what's happening in brains when they are under a significant amount of stress because it explains what we see in classrooms, it explains what we see in social service environments, human service environments, where adults and children who are under a significant amount of stress um, are not able to use the uh, core capabilities that they have to manage their life. As we get older, our, our 
brain loses connections, and that's a normal part of development, and it's driven by experience. But it turns out kids growing up in poverty over prune, they, it's called cortical thinning. So they get rid of too many of those connections. But it turns out that if you look at kids growing up in poverty who have really good caregiving, so these are moms and dads who are very sensitive and consistent and really there for their kids, they don't show that. Making sure babies get the experiences they need during the early years and empowering them with self-regulation and executive function skills is part of the curriculum of high-quality ECD programs around the world. To name just a few, Chile Crece Contigo in Chile, Reach Up in Jamaica, India and Bangladesh, the Madrasa program in Africa and the Middle East, International Step-by-Step -Step Association in Europe, and Parents as Teachers in the US. What happens when the best lessons from experts such as Maria Montessori, Jean Piaget and Joseph Novak are combined with the learnings emerging from the leading brain research centers? The result is SENDI, one of the most successful parenting and early childhood programs located in Monterrey, Mexico. This network of public early childhood centers and preschools was created by Tierra y Libertad, a social movement founded in the 1970s that serves the region's most socially and economically disadvantaged people. The key to their success is highly qualified teachers supported by a team of nutritionists, pediatricians, psychologists, doctors and nurses. This team interacts on a daily basis, not just with the children, but their parents, family members, and the wider community. While the centers are free, they are open only to children of working mothers and require that families abide by a set of rules that insist on all family members, including grandparents, being involved. Hay mucha diferencia entre guardar niños y cuidarlos y educarlos. Nosotros buscamos educar niños, no, no guardarlos, porque eso simplemente las guarderías es un trabajo asistencial, dar alimentos y cuidado. Y el Centro de Salud Infantil ya tiene una visión integral. Estamos haciendo niños talentosos, niños eruditos, niños muy inteligentes, con una sensibilidad social con una conciencia social de quién es él, de quiénes son sus compañeros, desarrollar la empatía, el respeto por los demás. También vienen los papás. Los papás también se tienen que educar. 85% of Sendi children have altered the course of their future lives. How many of these children would have gone to college, become entrepreneurs, or enjoyed fulfilling professions and relationships had they not gone to the Sendi schools? No wonder the program is now being replicated in other parts of the country, as well as Brazil, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Ecuador, and the Dominican Republic. Do six million children on five continents dramatically improve their learning and behavior and master the tools they need to succeed? The answer is teaching them to self-regulate and understand how behavior has a lot to do with their brain. This is the magical formula of mind up, lessons and strategies based on the latest scientific findings. Cortex is this. Bit. And what does it do? 
It helps you solve problems. The hippocampus stores your great memories. Your amygdala um, helps you. It tells you to run away, fight, or stand still. If your amygdala's all shaken up and you're feeling like you want to, what does it tell you to do? Run. Run. How can we how can we calm it down? Because we know there's not a real bear. Come on, let's calm. How are we going to calm it down? What could we do? Come on, let's count ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. One of the easiest ways of helping children learn how to self-regulate is the practice of meditation, and this is reaching classrooms around the world where children are more focused and are doing better in class, in the playground, and at home. One of the high-quality programs that focus on this by applying science-based research is the David Lynch Transcendental Meditation Foundation. Our first and foremost focus is to go into the schools, not just in schools in the United States, all over the Middle East, all over Latin America, all over Asia and Africa. That makes me feel calmed down, relaxed, and not so, so excited, so excited, so excited. We're not meditating for ourselves. This is not just for me. This is 20 minutes or 10 minutes if you're a kid, so that the next 10 hours, you're more yourself. You're more generous. You're more clear thinking. You're making decisions not based on fear or greed or small thinking, but you're making decisions in a more integrated way. And why? Not because you've learned some philosophy, because your brain is functioning the way it's supposed to. Ellen Galinsky, author and chief science officer of the Bezos Family Foundation, has spent decades compiling cutting-edge early childhood brain research to figure out what is it that children need to keep their passion for learning alive. The results are Mind in the Making and Vroom, high-quality brain-building programs that focus on a strong civic science approach that boosts executive function. These programs serve families and professionals, including social workers and community leaders. The skills in Mind in the Making are focus and self-control to be able to manage distractions. The second skill is perspective taking. And perspective taking is understanding how other people think and feel. I got a funny head. The next skill is communicating. Daddy. Communicating is not just literacy or language. It's thinking about what it is you want to say. It's understanding how the other person might hear it, um, and therefore how you might say it in a more effective way. The next skill is making connections, and that is categorization. How do things go together? But it's also a critical aspect of creativity. In creativity, you're reassembling the world to see it in new ways. Critical thinking is critical in this world where we're not necessarily making decisions uh, on valid information, where there are alternative facts. Um, being able to think critically and know what's real and what's valid in order to inform your own actions and your own behavior. Taking on challenges is the next skill. If knowledge is changing so rapidly, we have to be able to try that problem that we don't know how to do. The final skill is being a self-directed, engaged learner. Ultimately, that's what we all need in this world. We need people who are, who are ongoing learners. I think that's the way we're going to need to uh, be effective in this world, whether we're two years old or whether we're 60 years old. Although there is still much to learn, science and high-quality ECD programs are proving that these early years are crucial in mapping out the rest of a child's life. And that not only impacts their family and neighborhood, but also society at large because now we know that investing in ECD even has positive effects on a country's economy. Business people all the time whine about the quality of graduates. 
And they also know how to talk about return on investment. Well, you want return on investment, I give you the best thing you could give. If you really care about jobs, 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 then I'm telling you jobs, jobs, jobs begins with that little baby here. For every dollar you invest, the present value of earnings will go up at least $5 and maybe $10. They're gonna get translated into higher tax revenue lower expenditures on welfare and other transfer programs. And there are numerous studies showing that high quality early childhood education not only increases earnings of those who participate, but also reduces the chances they'll get involved in criminal activity. 43% of, of children who are not quite achieving their potential, which basically means almost half the children, and we can look at that in terms of human capital loss, in terms of growth equity loss, in terms of competitiveness of economies. But most importantly, we've already put that little baby girl or baby boy on a back footing before the game even begins. Both the public and politicians need to be aware of the fact that uh, if you're going to get results from early child education, you need to invest enough per child that you can run these programs in a high quality way. Uganda, Finland, Chile, Brazil, these are just a few of the countries that have national programs designed to apply the science and legislate and finance high quality projects. Another inspiring example is Colombia. Its government has created a law making the early years a state priority, and since then has tripled the amount of money and resources invested in every child per year. Esto quiere decir que no importa el partido político que gane cualquier elección, la primera infancia siempre será prioridad y lo más importante, los recursos no pueden disminuir. Colombia has um, several unique features. Um, it is one of those uh, integrated and coordinated uh, ECD policies that covers uh, multiple sectors uh, uh, of services. It has a very strong commitment to the diversity of the country and to the 120 or more languages, the uh, uh, indigenous and ethnic minority groups. Adicional a que existe una clara voluntad política, se dio también una gran movilización y compromiso del sector privado y del sector de sociedad civil. Mis Primeros Pasos, created by the Genesis Foundation, is one of the high-quality ECD programs working in Colombia today, impacting the lives of 13,000 children every year in very different regions of the country. Their approach is all-inclusive and caters to children born in Afro and indigenous tribes. What's unique about this program is that the team designs and develops strategies within the communities they serve, with the help of local leaders. Somos conscientes que los niños en condiciones de, de vulnerabilidad que tienen problemas de nutrición, eh, niños que son expuestos a situaciones de conflicto, su cerebro también se ve afectado. Developing innovative teacher training programs, supporting ECD networks, and influencing public policy is part of the Foundation's mission. Today, it also focuses on strategies to help children and mothers who have been severely affected by 40 years of armed conflict. The early years are crucial, but because our brains remain plastic throughout our lives, so are all the years that follow. In fact, the benefits of a high-quality early education program can be lost quickly if children are moved to inadequate environments. That is why the ECD Global Community suggests that any improvements made to the educational standards that follow should be inspired by the learnings of early childhood development and spearheaded by the children and families receiving the benefits today.
While some of these children may thrive and others might not, we now know that the experiences they are exposed to and the skills they acquire early on truly matter for the brain's development. The early years are an unrepeatable opportunity to improve their chances of happiness and success and the best way to help them fulfill their dreams, whatever they may be. When I become big, I want to be a scientist or a teacher. We often look at the cost of inaction very much in economic terms. And we calculate the cost of inaction, you know, to governments and societies. But oftentimes we don't take into consideration the cost of inaction to that individual child and who she becomes. Princess Pirate. ¿Qué te gustaría hacer de mayor? Cocina. Because who knows what this child could have accomplished in discovering a cure for something, or writing a great novel, or exploring a new horizon. ¿Y por qué quieres ser doctora? Porque tengo un juguete de doctora. Porque mi mamá es una doctora. Uh, I want to be an uh, astronaut. The scientific evidence is very clear as to what we should do and how we would do it, and it would lead to better outcomes. It would lead to a better society for everyone. Either want to be a soccer player or a scientist. Salvar a la gente. Basquetbolista. I want to rescue animals. Es que ya sé cómo rebotar la pelota y cruzar del pie. Pero lo único que me faltan son los demás pasos. Your brain only gets built once. Your brain may change several times during your lifespan, but this is the only time the brain gets built. Um, pintor. I want to be a lawyer. Parents knowing that this is not simply feel good, and it is, does feel very good, but parents knowing there's real research behind all of this is really critical. Uh, that there is, um, if you will, a seal of approval on all of this, that we know we have the research, we know this works. No matter what you believe politically, the science tells us that um, it, there is something that we can do as a society. Mm, una estrella de rock. And I want to be a rock star.